So today we have, uh, I want to welcome everyone and thank you, all, thank you all for being here. I'm so excited about today's webinar, our third one. And I'm delighted to present our guest speaker, Jade Burial, that I have the opportunity to meet through the Children and Nature Network. And before I do the formal introduction uh, of her in a minute, I just want to let you know that as you are arriving, you can and settling in, you can like write your name in the chat, uh, say where you're from, and and like as a way to you know introduce yourself and welcome everybody. So the format uh, is like 40 minutes of presentation and 20 minutes of of Q and A question and answer at the end. So you can use the chat box to post your questions and Renda and I will collect those questions um, and we will like facilitate the process at the end. Also, if you don't have any question while the presentation is going on, but you do have questions toward the end of the presentation, we will also help you to facilitate that you unmute yourself and that you have the, the possibility to ask directly your question. But um, if you don't feel that you want to open the mic for everybody and you just want to post your question at the, in the chat, uh, we will be happy to take care of that. So uh, saying that, I just want to uh, read uh, Jade's very old personal biography. So Jade is a physical geographer, environmental educator, outdoor instructor, and guide, and guide based in Revelstoke. Uh, Jay has been designing and delivering environmental and nature-based programs for over 15 years across four continents and seven countries. She runs outreach and events for the Columbia, Columbia Basin Environmental Education Network, the Outdoor Learning Store alongside her own educational consultancy, a stoke on science. In 2022, she hosted online ProD workshops that reached over 10,000 educators across Canada and the US, helping to support educators to take their learning outside, bring her, bring her the greatest joy. Alongside showing people her rock collection, learning the language of the Cynics and Kunasa First Nation and talking to the trees in her garden. So Jade, welcome. And I just want to also say that today our webinar title is Indigenous Knowledge in Nature Education. So welcome, thank you for your generous time and the mic is yours. Thank you so much, Elena. Muchas gracias. Uh, Lim, Lim. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, it really is the morning for me. It's 6 a.m. Um, so please forgive me, that, you know, if I... Um, yeah, if I yawn at some point, but uh, I've only had one cup of tea and normally I'm like a two or three cup of tea in the morning type human. So uh, let's see how we go. But I'm so grateful for each and every one of you here. Um, and uh, some lovely conversations happening in the chat and just so fabulous to see such a diverse group of people here. So I'm, I'm really honoured to be here with you and I'm going to start my presentation and dive right in because 60 minutes is not very much. So this is Indigenous knowledge in nature education. I am a non-Indigenous person and this is this is the, the biggest and one of the most complex topics um, that is facing people that work in nature education wherever you are in the world and that is a connection to Indigenous perspectives um, and the languages and traditional ecological knowledge of your place. So this is really focused on um, traditional knowledge from Canada and specifically where I am in, in the interior of British Columbia. But a lot of these concepts, um, and I'm going to introduce some concepts that if you're not living in Canada, things like truth and reconciliation that might not be in your in your lexicon or your toolkit yet that I'm going to share uh, that have been a part of my journey um, and we're going to see where we end up again questions are so welcome as a non-indigenous person am I I'm on a learning journey 
it's constant, it's evolving, it's challenging. Um, and, you know, as a British person, I was born in England, uh, wherever I have lived in the world, um, I have seen the impacts of colonialization from my people. And so um, it is confronting. The reason I live in Canada now uh, with such ease and grace is because of visas that exist because of uh, an initial connection to the Commonwealth, of which really the only Commonwealth was for the uh, sort of white um people and not the indigenous communities of the countries that we went and stole land from so some of the uh conversations and the topics might be and might feel a bit heavy today it is quite heavy heart work but i ask that uh, we come to it um into this space with a sense of um openness with a sense of uh, inquiry into our feelings and I've experienced some very challenging experiences uh, through this work of building relationships with Indigenous mentors of which there is no pan Indigenous you know uh, mindset or uh, approach and there are uh, you know hundreds of different First Nations in, in Canada alone each with their own languages and um, each with their own set of protocols and cultural uh, context so it's really um you'll see most of this about indigenous knowledge in nature education is finding who your people are and 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 building relationships and, and receiving knowledge that way but I, I hope you're welcome to come along with the journey and explore my journey into this with me and see how we go um as Elena said, I, I am an environmental educator. I'm a physical geographer and environmental chemist by trade. Um, I spent a lot of time, I work with um, paleoclimatic reconstruction. So I use micro fossils to reconstruct past environments. I spent a bit of time as a scientist uh, around the world, um, finding fossils and taking data from their shells and um, the environments they lived in, in order to submit into global circulation models and reconstructing climate. Uh, and then I realized that I much preferred sharing knowledge with people about the world. And so I have written environmental ed programs for 15 years. Um, I live here, this is the um, Arrow Lakes Reservoir, which is an artificial reservoir formed when they dammed uh, the Columbia River uh, above and below where I live. And I'm here with some of this at grade 11 students um, talking about the impacts of mining and resource management um, in where they live, which this was a gold and silver mining area, um, which is now solely tourist area. And in the summer, it is incredibly vibrant, buzzing, full of life. And in the winters, it's dead. There is no uh, employment opportunities. There's an enormous amount of um, of uh, issues within the community in terms of uh, access to funds and wellness and so I think what's interesting about this work is you know it's lovely and we're going to talk about connecting to plants and trees and animals and the space around us but nature education taps in so much more to the social and conscious um, relationships that we have as as a people and one of the most beautiful things that I've taken from the Indigenous perspectives that have been shared with me um, is a connection to animism, where we uh, don't just see rocks as an inanimate object, um, but that uh, rocks, for example, are the repository of history, of stories of this land through landscape evolution, and basically just bringing a bit more meaning to the space that we're in. And that can be incredibly work good for our well-being, um, psychologically, emotionally. Um, and so this is this is soul work this is heart work and I hope that you'll uh, you'll join me on it so some of you might be aware um that in environmental education particularly in North America or what what indigenous people call this turtle island um most of the creation stories coast to coast um uh feature this this concept of of earth uh, um of North America as, as Turtle Island, and we're on the back of this beautiful turtle. And um, so I can say, uh, good morning, Gaitha Kwishnam Kabiniskis, Hunini Jade, Hugaki Yaki England, Hund Jitamikas Miskakis. I, my name is Jade. This is Tanaha, this is the language of the Tanaha First Nations who live um, 
on the east side of, of the headwaters of this, which is the Columbia River, um, or the Mishkakis River, the Chickadee River. Um, this is a map of um, produced by the autonomous Sinaixt, and those are the people whose homeland I'm really on. So this is Revelstoke here. You can see this beautiful, uh, this is a sturgeon nose canoe. It's a beautiful bit of technology that um, the Sinaixt, which means people of the bull trout, um, uh, invented. It takes a whole cedar tree, they hollow it, and then they use um, birch bark um, to protect the, to make it weatherproof. Um, and they have been utilizing this river um, since time immemorial. We think at least archaeologically 13 to 15,000 years that we can prove, but the Ice Age did a lot of washing away of evidence. And we're in a tradition where, um, in an oral tradition where things weren't written down in the way that um, Western societies um, save evidence, but there were pit houses all along this river. Um, the Sinaixt, um were declared extinct in 1956, just a few years before um, the settlers or non-Indigenous people who had come here, who had come from the coast uh, and had been guided, supported, encouraged, traded with, brought in by uh, Indigenous guides who were the only people could help um, navigate these incredibly scary and complex mountains um, the Monashies here to the west and the Selkirks um, and Revelstoke in Inselsheen which is the traditional language um, of the Snikes uh, and the Silks down here southwest um, is Kikiten where the ridge lines meet the water and that's that's what we see here I live right in the valley um, and then they came and then um, they decimated the population with smallpox in blankets uh, and bringing in fire water and alcohol. Um, and we declared the Sinaiks, we, we created such terrible conditions uh, and caught, brought so much disease that the Sinaiks uh, were officially declared extinct in 1956. And then a few years later, they signed the Columbia River Treaty with what is now the US and Canada to dam the river and create hydroelectric power. And so, you know, all of their pit houses, all of their, um, this is a group that moves seasonally up and down the river and up into the mountains and back down based on caribou, salmon, uh, the natural cycles of the land. Um, they were denied um, access to their ancestral and traditional hunting grounds and they were pushed, any remaining people uh, were pushed down south across the border and pushed onto a reservation with 11 other tribes, nations, they called them tribes back then, um, who didn't know each other, onto a tiny patch of land that was like not even 1% of their traditional lands, um, where they didn't speak the same languages. Um, and they remain there to their day. And now it's called the Colville Confederated Tribes of the Sinaiks. And um, their cultural elder, Shelley Boyd, is, is one of my personal mentors. And she's the reason that I do a lot of this work because I've sat in a room with the Tanaha, with the Sinaix, with the Okanagan silks who live southwest here in the sort of grassland plains where it gets a bit drier and the Shikwetmet to the west and I've sat and listened to them speak together about colonialism and the devastation on their um their culture so another big thing, if you're not familiar, and this is quite a heavy topic, and I'll, I'm only going to skirt over it because of, otherwise won't get anywhere. Um, but in Canada and the US, um, we implemented uh, a system, the Canadian government and the government in the US implemented a system of residential schools. And what they did was they forcibly took Indigenous children uh, from their families. And the last one closed in the 90s, in the 90s in Canada. They took Indigenous children and they took them to these boarding schools and they cut their hair, which in Indigenous culture, your hair is, is where your power is, where your ancestors live. It's that genetic link to, to your culture. They denied them. They banned them from speaking their Indigenous languages from practicing their culture or dances or drumming or anything. Um, they split siblings up, they forced them to learn English. And 
these were places where one in two of the children did not survive. Um, and very recently, they, using ground penetrating radar, discovered, and just two hours west of me in a place called Kamloops, they discovered the first mass graves of 215 children in a school. I don't know where there are many people in the world, places in the world where we would define a school as a place where half of the children that go there end up in a mass grave. And these were schools run by um, Christian um, wards who came from the state. And these children were, were taken from their families. Sometimes they were allowed to return for brief periods. Um, in the 60s, we had another thing called the 60s scoop where they would scoop up children from indigenous families and just take them to be adopted by white families with absolutely no contact with their original family, complete disconnection to their culture, complete disconnection to, the, to anything to do with their life just because they wanted to the Indian Act, which is the most racist piece of legislation that still exists in Canada today, is talks about killing the Indian in every child. Absolutely, in the US, this happened. Um, and there, there are obviously, wherever you live, there will be instances where um, traditional knowledge or a particular group have been discriminated against or that the system is inherently racist against. And this is what we see. And so the fact that I have a beautiful number of people, and I'll, I'll say their names because there's a big thing in Indigenous um, knowledge about sharing provenance, about sharing names, about where things come from. And so my mentors are Michelle Sam from the Tanaha, Faye O'Neill from the Tanaha, Jenna Jassik from the Tanaha and Shkwetmuk, Sasha Eugene from the um, Shkwetmuk, Shelley Boyd, Sinaixt, Larray Wiley, Sinaixt, um, Dale Thomas, Shkwetmuk, uh, Pauline Tobasket, Silks, um, Tim Patterson is Blackfoot from the East. These people have brought into my life such beauty and connection to place, despite the fact that my ancestors attempted to eradicate them. They utilized all the knowledge they could take from them and then they stole their lands and they tried to eradicate them. And it's devastating. But Indigenous people are still here. It's not just old songs and old drumming. There are a number, and I'll share at the end, there are some fantastic, beautiful resources. It is genocide. You're right, Imani. That is a word um, that Shelley Boyd particularly uses. There was a, it was a genocide. And through the ongoing lack of support societally um, and the fact that Indigenous communities primarily still don't have access to clean drinking water, have twice or triple the rate of suicide, uh, of alcoholism dependency. Um, because the system is still inherently racist and, and against supporting um, their uplift, it, it is incredibly challenging. But yes, there are people who are stepping out of that. There are people who are up, coming up, who are sharing amazing resources, who are sharing that Indigenous people are still here and language revitalization is happening. So there is, um, there are fantastic things happening, but I respectfully honor, I'm an uninvited guest here on the lands of the Sinaixt, the Tanaha, the Shikwetan, the Okanagan Silks, who have cared, stewarded, hunted, fished, loved, honored this land for time immemorial. And I am deeply grateful to live here. And it is that gratitude that resonates through all indigenous perspectives that, that lead me to this place um, of being able to share with you today with permission, some things, some things are shared just in that moment and are, are to be kept there. But I was very grateful to be a part of a medicine healing circle with um, Shikwetmuk and Blackfoot elders together who were doing a medicine walk, which um, I'll share about later. But I was given a task as the little one with the big mouth which is what almost all of my Indigenous mentors call me in some variation of that. Um, uh, and 
I've been tasked to uplift Indigenous voices. Like it's been, it's it's a pathway that I have been given in ceremony, and so this is this is why I'm here. And but these opinions are things that have been shared with me. But these are, this is just a, a journey for myself as well. And um, Amy, yes, absolutely. Um, the same thing happened in Australia, and I lived in Australia for several years and worked with Aboriginal people up north. Um, I lived in New Zealand and worked closely with Maori people and um, particularly in Australia. I mean, in Australia, the Aboriginal people until very recently in legislation were defined as fauna, as animals. And not in the sense that we're all animals as humans, as in you are lesser than you are in you. You are not a conscious, sentient being. These are people that lived in the most what looks like the most barren, inhospitable landscape for thousands of years that when, every, you know, the English shares first came, they were like, it's impossible to live here. You couldn't possibly. They spoke to the animals. They knew exactly where to get water and food in what looks like bare cracked earth. And you're telling me that those people are less than horrific. Um, this is a map that talks about where we live as shared, but the Sinaiics were declared extinct. And so what I will share with you is that if you are um, building relationships with the indigenous people, I have had four conversations with four different people who've had a very different truth about what this map looks like, about where their homelands are, about how things should be done. It is devastating uh, to see the intractable conflict that exists because we stole land and then people are left to fight over the scraps of what we've left behind as colonialized uh, colonializers so um I don't ever use the word I don't use this map but or in in the future when I talk about there is no shared land um there are shared children the land itself um, holds its own and belongs to no one it is utilized and so I really invite when you're on building these um relationships that you will experience some challenges to the language that we use and the way you describe it and I still make mistakes and I'm still pulled up on certain things but I'm I'm learning and the more conversations I have with indigenous people about how they want to be addressed how they want to express um, their feelings about a particular place or um, its specialness. Um, you just have to keep asking questions. And Imani says, you, I seriously doubt that non-white people can adequately compensate indigenous people for loss. Absolutely. We can't. You know, there's a land back movement. There's a movement to saying like, but the reality is so much of the culture, the language, um, the well-being has been decimated. It is. It is incredibly difficult. Um, and more than land was stolen, absolutely, cultural identity, a sense of, of uh, connection. Um, so, yeah, but this is this is what we can do is we can do the work. So a big thing for me and this um, most recently was was shared with me again by Dal Toma. He's a Shaquette McMahon, a salmon uh, fisherman. Um, he's also the cultural, indigenous cultural liaison for the city that I live in. And... Um, his thing is about gifts. And so in nature education, one of the greatest tools that I'm using with my students is the connection to gifts. And this is not just giving um, perhaps like a gift of tobacco that I might do if I'm speaking to an elder and based on the protocols of that person and you just ask outright, what are the, um, the gift or ceremonial um strategies or things that I can do with you to make you feel most comfortable if you're sharing um and I have been gifted tobacco myself which is then gifted to the earth in some in some concept but as a non-indigenous person the gift you could give the best gift you can give and this is from Dow and actually been reiterated by several other people is intention intention is everything and so when we take children out into nature taking the time to open with circle and ask them or set an intention for your time there. We are not going to pull living things off of trees. We are going to stay to the path and care for this planet. We are going to take this moment to sit in this space and 
uh, be one with this place. And so um, I'm going to take just a, just a minute. This is where I live. This is my morning walk. This is my little dog, Otis. He's helped me build relationships with the land. And as I walk, I say, good morning, Mother Cedar. This is a cedar hemlock uh, forest. It's part of the only inland temperate rainforest on Earth. It doesn't feel very rainy at the moment. We're having a dry spell uh, and it's only going to get worse with climate change. But good morning, cedar. Good morning, Father Hemlock. This is uh, the cedar is medicine um, used in teas for both ceremony and um, for supporting uh, immune system and um, uh, increasing capacity for your lungs. I'm so grateful for this peaceful moment. I'm so grateful for the 20, 30 different colors of green that I can see. I'm so grateful for the fallen trees that provide homes for new trees to grow out of or for the insects. I'm grateful for the birds. I'm grateful for the water, for the fish within the water that feed myself and the communities around me. I'm grateful for the air I breathe brought to me by these plants and trees. I'm grateful to be here alive in this place. Sukusukini, I'm grateful in Tanaha. Lim Limped, thank you in Sanaixt. Cook's Jam is thank you in Sekwepachin. And so the point of this is not to show you exactly where I live, but that in connection with land acknowledgements, a lot of people just use a land acknowledgement at the beginning of a workshop or anything. And like, I acknowledge the people that lived here. Um, but Tim Patterson, who's a master's of education, um, a Shikwet book man and one of my mentors, it's like, it's not just enough to talk about the people. A land acknowledgement, a connection to place, it's your relationship to it. What are you grateful for? What does it mean to you? What actions are you going to take in order to care for it going forward? And giving gratitude is an indigenous perspective. It's something that is inherent in um, practices when in nature. And so I encourage you to start and finish every session with gratitude and then a reflection. Um, and Wendy's saying unintentional, uneducated intentions can sometimes be harmful. And you're absolutely right. And this is why getting more education and the key whole thing you'll see through is build relationships with your indigenous people, whoever they are. Most have websites. You can have relationships. Um, and my biggest hint for you is don't send an email. Uh, is to either call the office if there's a cell number or write a, a written letter or turn up. I've also found using audio recordings has been, um, if you actually do have a number and you can't get through to leave an audio recording or something that is voice, uh, it, it can be a much better way of building um, that initial connection. Because um, without that, you won't be able to have the conversation um, that connects into your space, your land. Um, and those are the words that will help set the intention for where you are uh, and, and what, how that should be sort of delivered. Okay, I wanna give you a chance um, to wake up with me and to come into this space. So if anyone's got a, pen a pencil or pen and a bit of paper, it doesn't have to be a big piece, um, any kind of paper, I've got a small notepad. Um, one of my mentors, you might hear or hear a recording of her later, Jenna Jassip, talks um, about any time you are in nature, you are doing and honoring indigenous perspectives. And particularly when the intention is there um, to be interacting with awareness and also just listening. 
listening to the sounds that trees make, hearing their language talk. And now Western science, the work of Dr. Suzanne Samard is showing that trees do talk to each other through mycelium fungal networks under the soil. They share resources. They tell each other when attacks are happening or drought or whether they require um, some support with water or nutrients. And the indigenous people of my place, particularly anyway, have shared um, that cedar uh, and birch particularly talk to each other and, and share uh, and have conversations. And so you've got you have to listen. And so whenever I go out to nature, a big part, again, gratitude to open. The second part is a sensory wake up. And this is not an indigenous provided um, activity. This is my interpretation as a non-Indigenous person, not appropriating a drum circle or a prayer or calling in. There are some published prayers. There are some published poems, which I'll share one of them in a minute, where you can, um, when Indigenous people publish their work, you are uh, entitled in that moment to share it as long as you share where it came from. But this is my interpretation as a non-Indigenous person of the conversations I've had about how can you tune in? How can you open your ears and your heart into nature? And if you're in nature, um, uh, this would just be the sounds that you hear. But I'm going to ask you in one minute to draw for me what you hear. Now, that could be that you draw the physical things that you hear. It could be that you draw. I like to draw like a as if someone was an interpretive musician and they could draw, they could uh, hear my script um I was drawing a script that someone could follow but let's do a minute and if you don't have a pen and paper um or you're in a place maybe you could just close your eyes and listen and make a fist this works with younger children make a fist and each time you hear a different sound you can raise a finger see how many you get if it's more than 10 if you have older students, you can do this. If you're particularly if you're journaling or writing things down, you or having a moment of reflection, you can ask them what's the furthest away sound they hear or the closest. You could do mapping and have teach them about northeast, southwest, or directions. You could ask them what the sound is from the south or behind them to the east. Are most of the sounds natural or man-made? Are there any sounds that they like or don't like particularly? So, uh, but for this, let's do a, let's do an art activity. Um, your minute starts now. Draw the things for me, please. Okay. Is anyone brave enough to share this? I might have to turn my uh, virtual background off because it never works. Um, I think my office is mostly tidy today. This was mine. Um, I sort of the chime, the bills were sort of the bubbles and things. Hey, okay. hi, this is Elena. I'm sorry to interrupt. But I and I was confirming that with my uh, my people from my lab who are here at the course, but like we were not able to listen to the sound. Oh no! I'm so sorry. Let me try again. Let me add. Uh, um... Thank you. Okay. Well. Okay. Let's try again. Someone suggested to put down the ear. I don't know if that would work, but oh, it's okay. It should uh, just one sec. I think I just didn't click. Do you hear? 
Yes, now yes. Okay, I'll do one more minute again. Well, you yes. can see my you can see my uh, my thing now. So one minute, go ahead. Okay, would anyone else share what they did? It's okay. I know it can be nerve wracking to show people our art. Um, but again, just a moment of appreciation. And this is the thing, some of the nature education that we're going to be doing is not necessarily a space where we're going to be talking about the truth of um of what has been done to indigenous populations and how we can work on reconciliation or working towards better relationships and honor and respect with indigenous populations. But what you can do is honor the environment that you're in um, and, and building relationship and, and um, connection to it is, is a good place to start. Elizabeth was wondering about how to acknowledge and honor local indigenous people without appropriation. And Imani said, ask, and we or they will tell you. And that's exactly it. As I go through this, it is about building relationships. You are going to have to ask. And a thing we do as, as, um, uh, Western, I'm going to go Western because that's who I am. The thing we do in the societies that I am familiar with is that we're very afraid of making mistakes. So we don't ask. And the indigenous communities that I work with work very much more in a direct manner of communication, which is that, but, but it's not second guessing and things. Ask me a question and I'll tell you the answer. How is it best, and there's a little section on this, but gosh, we're running out of time. How is it best if we are asking you to come and deliver our um, a session or join us for an event um, to open things in a good way or welcome things in a good way? Um, you have to ask. But a big thing for me as well is it's not just about having uh, Indigenous people come. Indigenous people are facing huge barriers to access they're facing language death they, their elders um are, are limited it's not just about asking take 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 it's what we can give back and yes donating um to uh, indigenous groups supporting indigenous creators buying indigenous made resources where the funds go directly back to them campaigning against inappropriate or appropriation names in sports or things. Yes, Imani. Um, uh, it's a very, you know, these are the things we do in the moment. It's not just about pulling people in. This is Sasha Eugene. This was the first time I'm wearing an Every Child Matters flag. That's a Canadian sort of um, a movement that was created by a lady called Phyllis Webstad, who was a, a residential school survivor. Um, and it's, it started with a day called Orange T-Shirt Day, which is now the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation in Canada, which is June 21st. Today is the first day of National Indigenous History Month in Canada. So I'm incredibly grateful to be talking to you on this special day. Um, but Sasha was the first person, she was doing a medicine walk. She was walking from the Kamloops Residential School where her ancestors, her grandmother had survived. And she walked along Highway 1, which was the main arterial highway for several hundred kilometers. And she goes to the school, You, you she gathers the spirits and she walks them home um, to their reserve. She lives um, uh, between places called Cranbrook and Infamere in uh, Ackham. Um, and I walked with her for about 20K and then I, I pedaled back. But this was my first experience of doing something. Um, this is uh, like volunteering or whatever of building relationships. This was saying most of the other people that walked with her were, the, were Indigenous people. And just by looking at what 
Indigenous people doing in your community? Are they protesting? Are they um, working towards a project? How can you support Indigenous work rather than saying, can you come here and do my thing? How can I support what's important to you and what your uh, priorities are? And Indigenous perspectives have to be in, on Turtle Island and wherever you are, there will be an Indigenous population. They have to be at the heart of the work you do. Um, this is Faye O'Neill. I'm not going to play her because we're almost out of time and there's one more I'd like to play. But these are the four pieces of information that have been repeated to me in nature education um, from many different mentors in different places but the first one is to read indigenous stories if they are published if they are shared with you read indigenous stories uh, and uplift indigenous voices that way show that this information exists that these beautiful um uh perspectives and knowledge is still here and there are lots of modern stories there are lots of beautiful things but find stories of your place from your people and if you don't know who your people are you can go to native-land.ca it actually covers the whole globe learn the indigenous names for local places and things and trees plants animals it's incredibly important my age two different mentors but Michelle Sam um is a Tanaha woman who when I started learning Tanaha I've been learning Tanaha for two years I was in a meeting with her she was doing some like consultancy for our organization our non-profit organization and I knew she was there and I was really nervous but I welcomed her and said hello in Tanaha and she cried in the zoom room like this and she said you, you've no idea every time you speak your language which is dying and it's a unique language that if it goes there's no other language like it on earth I mean, every time you speak your language you breathe life into it you 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 bellow the the cold the the a spark of indigenous love and language from the land and these languages developed with the land they are descriptive um relational beautiful and so when we speak indigenous languages we breathe life and of course you need to have an indigenous educator and um, where i live you can get coast salish um interior salish in Selshin language lessons for free not only in written form but with audio in um uh, online you can um access like indigenous language courses like we're organizing with the Tanaha um so so reach out um say hey I'm a teacher I'm an educator I'd like to learn it's so important to me what could I offer you in exchange uh, for your language is it okay that I would like to share the language of the land with my students you know start that dialogue always on our info your information came from who your teachers are who your elders are who which stories you're reading and the biggest thing um, and Imani said, like intention, without intention, you can do bad things. I have said things, I have said the wrong things, I have used the wrong language. And actually, different groups will have different pers opinions, perspective, like all humans. This is not about putting Indigenous people up on a pedestal or any other group for that matter and saying, oh, you have all the knowledge and I'll just listen. But what it is, is that these this knowledge has existed and evolved with place for thousands of years and in nature we are nature we are part of it we are not separate from it and the stories that i'm reading that reignite that lost knowledge that we have as human beings that we are all connected that we are all related that the calcium in my bones is the same as the calcium in soil and the carbon in the trees and i we interchange i'm finding much easier access to those connections through indigenous resources than I am in my science resources or elsewhere so this for me is just that this is a when we're teaching in nature these are perspectives they just enhance everything you're doing but don't be afraid to make mistakes don't be afraid to ask if you don't know um and indigenous cultures that I work with have very different um sometimes societal um 
offerings and the ways that things are communicated. And you just have to dive in and see what happens and start to build real relationships. And then people will call you on the phone and and, and ask what's up or tell you what these things are happening. And you will realize like, oh, right. OK. We're all humans and uh, this is how you envision this. And this is what I'm trying to do. And let's let's work together. I just want to. Um, we have no time. I'm going to skip. Um, if you're looking for more learning, the organization I work with, we're a charitable nonprofit. We are running um, in conjunction and all of the content is written by um, indigenous creators. Um, and this is about truth and reconciliations. This is acknowledging the truth. Uh, of what colonialization has done to indigenous populations and working to reconcile and 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 restore relationship and um these speakers um uh you you do an online module and then each month there's a live speaker um and uh, this is a paid thing there are also lots of free resources that you can access um but real truth and reconciliation is is uncomfortable it takes time you can't just tick a box and do a land acknowledgement and say cool i'm honoring traditional perspectives you can't just read one story relationship relationship this is shelly boyd opening a conference that i gave for bc teachers uh, in october of last year we had 300 teachers and these these are her nieces uh, and their mum danica and this is a story that's written by a white woman um about the history of the Columbia River, but she wrote it in connection with the Sinaiics um, and shared the prophets. Her name's Eileen Delahanty Perks, and this book's called The Heart of the River. And I asked Shelley to open our, our conference, and I and I asked her if she would do something that that spoke the language of the land. And so she was going to translate the book into in Selshine and speak it. And what she did at the last minute, she invited these three young language speakers, and they uh this eldest um Gail Meyer was was quite fluent and the other two were really learning their language and this reading took twice as long as it should have there were stutters and all of these things and you can see all the teachers getting a bit twitchy and Shelley stopped them halfway through and she said look I just want you to know that this this is what real truth and reconciliation looks like supporting indigenous people to speak their language these girls 10 years ago would have been beaten for speaking their language it's been decimated we must do it so for me uh, learning indigenous perspectives um really involves relationship building and asking what do you need and Shelley said i need to bring my young people in and have you see how challenging it is for them to learn um and uh i think i will stop there and or maybe I will share um, just one more thing, but at the end, I just gonna skip. I had language lessons, I had all these things, but you know, life is so hard uh, to fit all these things in. And normally I do like a 90 minute, I'm gonna just share this one last recording. This is Jenna Jasek. She's um, my, uh, one of my indigenous mentors. She's Shikwetmuk on her mother's side and Tanaha on her father's side. Um, and this is these are her words. I have a podcast called Earthy Chats and I interview a lot of um, different speakers. We have several Indigenous people sharing about their position. I'll put a link in the chat while you're listening. It's just so magical. It just it blows my mind. Every day I learn something new. And I just wish we could be outside more because I just feel like I'm missing so many lessons. Like we have a right by the lake my offices and we have eagles and herons and ospreys and I'm sure there's more birds that I haven't seen falcons like what what's going on out there what are they doing I just want to know you know like and don't then, get Ian started on the birds though because oh. we'll be here for another hour he's like full yeah. bird expert the birds I'm, are a, I'm a recovering bird watcher are you <laughs> they I mean the natural world just amazes me and I'm so curious. I wish I had more time to just observe outside. Same yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've been chatting for an hour and normally, you know, these this this sometimes happens, but we could probably just keep going uh, until eternity. Um, but I just want to say thank you so much uh, for sharing your wisdom and your thoughts and, uh, you know, a bit of your heart and soul with us today. Well, thanks for having me. It's uh yeah I'm, I'm I'm thankful that 
uh, I get to share my heart because I am so passionate and I, I do hope others can connect and, and follow their heart's lead as well and really question um, everything outside and have some fun. Thanks. I'm sorry. I know there's less time for questions, but um, that's Jenna. She's the vice principal of Indigenous education for a school district where I live now. Um, a role that was created for her. Those that was her and her two kids in that picture. Um, but go outside, read stories, practice gratitude, build relationships with your Indigenous people. Um, hi, Amani. Um, the four seasons of Indigenous Learning by the Outdoor Learning Store, they are recorded, but you do have to sign up there. If you are Indigenous, there are um, subsidies or it can be offered free, but you have to send an email and, and get in the like registration system. Um, and you can say, if you email uh, this email and, and say, I sent you, then they will look after you and get you in. But um, most of them are recorded. Uh, this is the thing sometimes with um, working with Indigenous people, that recordings are uh, not a great thing. But yes, Imani, say I sent you um, and we'll get you on the course. Um, and we're seeing about 30% of the people joining us for this course are Indigenous. And we've got um, different perspectives from, from across Turtle Island. And it's really fantastic. And Robin Wall Kimmerer. And so I'm going to put in the... Um, chat here this is the resource um sorry i didn't put it in well oh i can't access i can't share files elena but i sent i think maybe you could send it in the email afterwards but i have a little pdf there's three things in there there's the united nations rights for indigenous people document that you should read um there's the 96 calls to action from the truth and reconciliation commission of canada um which again is relative to our place but it talks about 96 things that we should be doing to support indigenous populations and, I, and it's a tiny bit dry but i highly recommend you read it and then i have a link to braiding sweetgrass for young adults which is monique gray smith's adaptation of robin moore kimmerer's book i hosted her she was a keynote at the last conference i just hosted in banff in may um there was a national outdoor learning conference and we'll be doing another one next may and it is a very beautiful deep dive into the concept of indigenous connection to nature. And I, I highly recommend every re everybody read it. Um, we do have on the Outdoor Learning Store, a whole indigenous resources section. They are all created by indigenous people. We partner with an indigenous owned and operated publishing house called Strong Nations. Um, and uh, yes, read and buy indigenous resources. That's my thing. Sorry, questions? Oh, thank you so much, uh, Jay. Let's um, give, our, give her a round of applause. Uh, thank you for this inspiring presentation and talking from the, from, like, from the heart about your experience uh, working with indigenous knowledge. Uh, so yeah, we have a very, very brief uh, short time, but I think Mark and Imani uh, uh, have um, written like two or three questions in the chat. So I would just invite you to unmute and ask them if you may. So I think Imani started and then Mark, and then we'll see if we have time for other questions. My question, this is Imani, is do you know of any book or compilation of indigenous wisdom that we can use in nature education? Um, all I'm finding are uh, stories uh, and quotes, which are fine, but I'm looking for more specific uh, information, um, edible plants, what they know about um, the forest, riparian forest, things of that nature. Thank you. Thank you, Imani. Lovely to, to speak to you. I'm going to share this slide that I didn't get to. These are some of my favorite resources. I do work, I work with a charitable nonprofit called the Outdoor Learning Store. And like all of these courses and all of the things we do directly support Indigenous groups. Um, and in a way that we really like to support our Indigenous creators um, more than anybody else, um, I would say, in, in reparations and uh, relationship building. But 
um you know there are it depending where you are but this is an amazing book natural curiosity the importance of indigenous perspectives in children's inquiry this is if you're programming planning there's lesson plans there's um case studies there's conversations and this is written by Doug Anderson he's Anna Schnabek um alongside the University of Toronto working together there um uh, educational department so it's it's pedagogical um but really in an accessible way um strong nations have a book called um the strong stories it's actually um 80 books and a bunch of them have like uh, some of them are stories but they all have like an activity or a, th- uh, a sort of connection to science or world views um if you're um there's medicine to help us this is metis plant use but because metis are coast to coast there's uh, plants basically from across north america um braiding sweetgrass the braiding sweetgrass for young adults um uh, this is a group uh, a thing by a, a shimsham artist called bill helene it comes with um, you can buy all the things individually but there's this book animal cares for mother earth it's a teaching resource that connects um different animals to ideas of indigenous perspectives and talks into that um but i'm going to share a link um which is um to uh the indigenous resources list um that we have on our store and you should be able to find everything there we have different we're developing different plant guides for different nations at the moment where there's english um and the indigenous name for plants and animals um yeah and everything we do there all the money goes straight back into indigenous creators straight in their pocket and um there's a whole um range of them yet the author of brain and sweet grass she's amazing um robin wall kimmer and yeah she's opening our um our four seasons of learning uh, online course too. Uh, was that there was another question, right? Yes, I think we have time for Mark's questions. Potentially. I think I have to go, so I can't. But one one aspect was: um, Do you link with other indigenous peoples from other regions, and is there a commonality between your area and that area? even though the indigenous language may be different, mm. the values may be the same or not. It, it, it does vary. And I'm very lucky because I, in this work, I'm working, you know, I'm working with the author of Cedar in the Land, who's Mohawk from the East. Um, and, and I've worked with Métis creators. Um, there are commonalities. Um, animism, that all living, all, all of our relatives, this is a term I hear again and again, that, that we are related to all of it, even the, indig- uh, the inanimate objects. And so that perspective, I would say, is there. But other than that, there's not a lot of pan-indigeneity. Um, there are these really complex and particular relationships with different plants and animals. Uh, the languages, uh, Tanaha, like I said, is, is a, it's a completely, I can't remember what the fancy word is, but it's a completely unique language. But where I am, the Shaquetmik silks in Selshi languages are, are sort of the same. Um, so there was definitely that that sort of relationship and evolution. Um, but genuinely, I haven't met or interacted with a concept yet that I haven't been like, oh, 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 how lovely. Oh, how lovely that the wind um, is there to uphold you and, and support you uh, when I talk to um Ariana Wendorona Ram Point, who talks to me about the wind, uh, she's Mohawk, um, that there, because they get a lot of wind over the Great Lakes, the wind is is your, your greatest supporter, it's your power, um, it's there to remind you to stay grounded, but to be flexible. So yeah, they've all been really individual, but I, I would just say, you know, find your people, talk to your local people, offer support, before asking for things and and build relationships that you can say um i if if you have capacity please share with me because i feel like these concepts will resonate and and they do they resonate deeply in my heart and soul against any of the other pedagogies or cultural support or things i've been connected to um in my life but this connection to place is is like no other and it shifted my entire approach I'm a scientist. I studied geology. Like 
rocks is literally defined as the study of non-living things it's nonsense have you ever sat with a rock and kids and asked them to talk to the rock and hold the rock and ask it for questions it's it's a game changer it's a game changer thank you so much jade uh well it's time to end our webinar i would like to ask you uh, to give another round of applause to Jay. Thank you so much for your generous, again, time and like uh, presentation. Um, uh, now we are going to uh, go to the second part of the webinar, which is optional for Chinese uh, speaker, where Renda is going to facilitate some languages, um, some translation of your presentation, Jay. We are all welcome to, to say goodbye. And then people who are here from Chinese language are welcome to join Brenda for any language support regarding this webinar. Thank and you for having me. I put my email in the chat. I know I couldn't answer all the questions. It's outreach at outdoorlearningstore.com. If you have personal questions or you need support with resources, please reach out. I'd love to support you uh, going forward. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And I will- Lim your resources to the platform, course platform. Thank you so much. So nice to have you here. Thank you for having me. Ciao, White. So Renda, are you, uh, if you can open your microphone, so I'm sure that you are here before like uh, leaving the meeting, I would uh, appreciate that. Yeah, thank you, Elena. So now we're gonna move to the Chinese session.